Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. I am Yolanda Stevens, and my pronouns are she, her. I am a Black female, and I'm wearing a mint green blouse. My Black hair is pulled back in a pony, and behind me is a white, a white background with the name of my employer, the National Alliance to End Homelessness. There I have the pleasure to serve as a program and policy analyst focused on older adults who are experiencing homelessness, which quite naturally includes a focus on healthcare. I appreciate your joining us today and look forward to our conversation on this critical topic. I thought I'd share a little bit about the Alliance, what we do and how we carry out our work. We work primarily through three departments and are, and are supported by our, our operations, communications, and events teams. In our policy and program department, we help to educate policymakers and the field about issues, strategies, and policies for ending homelessness, and lead support and advocacy efforts on a grassroots level. Through our capacity department, we provide training and technical assistance to communities. We have an online learning system to help support the orientation and training of staff and support the design and implementation of crisis systems. And our Homeless Research Institute analyzes data, trends, and publishes research. Our work is carried out through an equity lens and alongside those with lived experience. I uh, wanna talk a little bit about some housekeeping points. You all are in listen only mode. We'd love to know who's online. So please share your name and organization in the chat as I see some of you have already started to do so. Joining me in supporting this webinar is my coworker, Rachel Purcell, our online learning manager, who will help with any technical issues you may have. So please use the chat for technical issues. Let's reserve the Q&A for questions for the presenters. They will answer questions at the end of the presentation. Um, also, the slides will be posted on our website early next week, and they will also be emailed to all registrants. We are grateful that you have chosen to participate in our conversation that really is distilled down to inclusivity. And what better time to talk about lifting the voices of older adults than during Older Americans Month? Without further ado, I'll ask the panelists to please come on video so that the audience can meet you. The panelists will help us to understand how to create and engage older adults in opportunities, what it means to be heard and included, and how it can positively impact our community. So without further ado, I'll start off with Sharon. Would you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon. I'm Sharon Dreyer. I live in Fairfax County, Virginia, where I am a member of the Fairfax County Commission on Aging. I'm a nurse by education. I had a wonderful, varied career, including eight years at Hospice of Northern Virginia, and then 19 years as Director of Senior and Specialized Housing in Fairfax. I was happily married for 48 years. I've been widowed for five. I have two children and two grandchildren. I live in a retirement community where I spend a good portion of my spare time playing with clay and doing pottery. And I'm a genuine older adult. Thank you, Sharon. And then next, um, D.D. Forrest, which, um, I'm sorry, D. Forrest, would you, Hancock, would you please introduce yourself? I get all tongue-tied because, number one, she has on uh, my favorite color, purple, and uh, we have a affectionately uh, called her as she has requested, D.D., Dee Dee. so please, D.D. Dee Dee. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm officially D. Forrest Hancock, and my nickname is D.D. I am a senior, actually born native in San Diego, California, 
I've lived here in San Diego all but 15 years of my 69 years of life. I uh, am I'm a member of HEAL, which is under the San Diego Housing Federation. HEAL is the Homeless Experience Advocacy and Leadership Network. I am a member of, proud member of Voice of Our City Choir. I was considered a homeless choir, but we are so proud of being getting the golden buzzer in 2020 of AGT. So, um, I am also uh, the uh, lived experience on the lived experience expertise advisory board of the UC San Francisco Benny Hop Homeless Housing Initiative statewide survey, uh, and that's about it. It sounds like a lot. So it's thank enough. you very much. So next, uh, if you ever wonder how to create an effective volunteer program and engagement with older adults and in support of older adults, you need look no look any further than with our next panelist, Linda Hernandez Giblin. Please introduce yourself. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you all. I have the pleasure of working in the same area as Sharon Dreyer. I'm also part of the Volunteer Solutions Team, which is part of the Department of Family Services here in Fairfax County. So I have a, a master's in social work, and um, we'll keep sharing more as we go along. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. So next, we will start the presentation. So the um, information that we have is, let's start off talking about what does it, what does it mean uh, when we talk about Older Americans Month? Here we go. I'm sorry, I'm having just a little te technical difficulties advancing my slides. Here we go. We've already talked about housekeeping. We have this agenda, which talks about the introduction of the panelists, which we have completed. We'll talk about an overview of Older Americans Month, go over some demographics of older adults, the benefits of lifting voices, and we'll have a panel discussion, uh, and then Q&A from you, the audience. So, when Older Americans Month was established in 1963, only 17 million living Americans had reached their 65th birthday. A meeting in April 1963 between President John F. Kennedy and members of the National Council of Senior Citizens led to designating May as Senior Citizens Month, now known as Older Americans Month. Every president since Kennedy has issued a formal proclamation during or before the month of May, asking that the entire nation pay tribute in some way to older adults in their communities. Led by the Administration of Community Living, which is a, an organization within the Department of Health and Human Services, this year's theme is Aging Abound. It offers an opportunity for us to explore a wide range of aging experiences. And it's also a time for us to highlight important trends and strengths of our community, and our commitment really to honoring older adults. So let's take a look at some of these selective demographics of older adults. I thought we'd start with the 2021 profile of older Americans, which is uh, a report issued by the Administration for Community Living. As you can see, it talked about people age 65 plus represented 17% of the population in 2020. That's 55.5 million, which is expected to grow to 22% by 2040. In 2020, four states with the highest percentage of the population 65 plus were Maine, Florida, West Virginia, and Vermont. 
and 51% of Americans age 65 and older lived in nine states. Those nine states were California, as you can imagine, Florida, Texas, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina, and Michigan. Now, would you be surprised to know that of those states with the highest number of older adults, remember there were nine, six of those states have poverty rates at or above 10% for older adults? As you can imagine, that really helps to explain why older Americans living in poverty can become at risk of becoming homelessness. Some of the other information that's listed on this slide talks about gender. And as naturally uh, occurring, we have more women compared to men and women earn less than men. Um, part of the other aspect of the population shows that in 2021, 5 million people age 65 and over lived below the poverty level. And then about 2.6 million were near poor. Um, there's a great disparity in the gender, as, as you saw, and also when it comes to race and ethnicity. The disparities uh, that exist among older adults show that when compared to uh, white older Americans, about 17.2% of Blacks live in poverty compared to 6.8% of white older Americans. And you can see the rest of those percentages listed on the slide that show 11.5% of Asian Americans and 16.6% .6 of those of Hispanic ethnicity. It also talks about people's living arrangements. And as you can see, there were about 15, a little over 15 million older adults who lived alone. And about 10 million of those were women. So when considering the profile, it's, it's really evident that women, especially women of color, those are living alone, are more likely to age into poverty when compared to men. And of course, this certainly shows and demonstrates that more men were married when compared to women. Another important data point shows that Harvard's Joint Center on Housing indicated that of older adult renters, 2.2 million, 2 .2 million had incomes that were, were designated as worst case housing needs. That means that they are paying more than 30% of their income to meet their rental costs. Now, this sort of helps to lead into the grain of the homeless population. We just heard that more women are experiencing poverty, they are living alone, um, and that, and, and also that they are uh, disparities when it comes to race and ethnicity. And when we look at the causes of homelessness, uh, especially among older adults, of course, poverty is up there. Living alone, so for example, an older adult who experiences some type of health care condition, there isn't anyone to take care of them. We're living on fixed incomes which means that any type of unusual medical expense or some other unexpected uh, expense could push this person into homelessness. We currently don't have a definitive number of older adults who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and that occurs for um, a certain reason, for example, um, as, oops, I'm sorry, I moved ahead. But as the, as the uh, previous slide indicated, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, 
collects this data from the continuum of care. So those individuals in communities that go out on an annual basis, the last week in January, to survey how many people are experiencing homelessness. So this is a snapshot. And what um, CLCs then do is they provide this report, this information to HUD, who then shares with us uh, on an annual basis, what is the um, assessment of people who are experiencing homelessness in the US. And there are three age categories, one uh, under 18, 18 to 24, and over 24. So you can imagine that because that over 24 is such a large category, it will be hard to determine how many of those in that category were 65 and over. Fortunately, HUD has made a change to that hit reporting process. And so this year, 2023, those CLCs began to provide that data um, in an expanded age category. So in other words, instead of the age category being um, over 24, it is now like 25 to 34 and so on and so on until you get to 65 and older. So we are looking forward to seeing with the 2023 uh, data report how many older adults in the U.S. were actually experiencing homelessness during that snapshot, that one week of time in January. This slide, which might be a little hard for you to see, um, really is meant to highlight the trend in homelessness within the U.S. Um, towards the end of the slide, you will see the year 2022. And what it shows is that the number of people who were unsheltered, that's the lower light blue line, exceeded the number of people who were sheltered. That, and in that case, sheltering means they were living in um, a shelter or some type of transitional housing. So why is all this important? Well, first we heard that the people uh, 65 and over are growing. At least 10% are living below poverty and another large percent are what's called uh, near poor. We have more women than men living longer, living alone, and more than 2.2 million older adult renters who are really, um, experiencing some severe cost burdens when it comes to uh, housing. So we can see the tsunami coming and have been aware of it for a while. So these individuals may be coming seeking assistance. And I want us to hear what's important. What's important to older adults? How can we best serve them? One way we know is to include them in program development. And this gets to our conversation about the benefits of lifting voices. Why is authentic engagement is important? First of all, because it's the right thing to do. It's key to system transformation. It brings diverse perspectives, new ideas. It expands stakeholders. I don't know how many of you may remember the saying, if you build it, they will come. Well, I'd like to say, when you build it together, it will be used effectively. It's intentional. Power is shared and each voice has equal value. Engaging and actively listening to individuals with experience will bring richer, more knowledgeable input. Meaningful engagement can be an antidote to some forms of inequality with the potential to empower and to have meaningful impact. What does that mean by having meaningful impact? Well, for an individual, it can impact your health and well-being to be engaged. 
We know that this is important to older adults in particular. You may have seen some written reports on loneliness among older adults. And I think actually the US Surgeon General emphasized that addressing loneliness is a critical public health priority. So here we're talking about a sense of belonging for programs having the in, are including older adults and people with lived experience allows for a more collaborative, innovative, creative, uh, and accessible solutions to be uh, developed. And it can also help to focus on those who may be hard to reach. You know, when you have some engagement and there's some purpose behind involvement. Uh, in this case, policies and practices are developed with full and direct participation of the members of the groups that will be most affected by them. So it really is meant to help to drive policy change through authentic collaboration with advocates and providers and those with lived experience. Now, how does it impact the community? Well, social connection is an important determinant of community well-being and is associated with improved population health, safety, resilience, and economic prosperity. In a report by the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute, it showed that civic infrastructure affects how long and how well we live. So when you have neglected civic in infrastructure, such as schools and parks and libraries and other things, it impacts how well a community thrives. If you have a, a really well-developed civic infrastructure, it can help to foster a sense of belonging. Um, and it isn't just about uh, a sense of belonging. It's even further than that. It is about having things that show the consequences, how it impacts our health, how we can create an environment that shows a connection between our civic health and thriving people and places. So we kind of set the context for our conversation with our panelists. And I'm going to ask them to each come on online so that we can talk a little bit further about what it means to be authentically engaged and how that helps to really uh, imp positively impact not only the individual, but the program, and finally, the community at large. So we, um, I'd like to think about starting our conversation with each of you sharing a little bit about the roles. In your initial introduction, you shared um, some overview of, of, your, of who you are and your role. And I thought we'd get a little deeper in that. And so Didi, let's start with you. Can you share a little bit about your role with the Homelessness and Housing Initiative uh, Lived Expertise Advisory Board. Tell us how did you become a member and what is the work of the board? It might help. <laughs> I became a member as a chair through uh, being a member of HEAL, Homeless Experience and Advocacy Leadership. Network and the lead uh, organizer, uh, I guess now two years ago, actually uh, shared with the members that there was a board uh, seat available for the statewide survey. And I, I applied and was interviewed and to my surprise was offered a seat. And so here I am uh, on the board to represent San Diego, um, the survey done in San Diego. Um, I, was motivated by joining that, um, that lived 
advisory board because it was being presented at the state level and it would uh, actually give real data on the homeless situation and how to resolve uh, and end homelessness at a complete state level all across California, which is very important for us here. Um, and it's important to understand that there are eight members of the board of the survey that's administered in eight different regions. And each region represents the county similar to their demographics with regards to the um, homeless population in other areas. Um, for example, the, the surveys that were administered in the county of San Diego uh, represent the Central Coast and Southern California, which includes the homeless, uh, sheltered, and unsheltered communities of Monterey, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Ventura, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino. Uh, the remaining seven, uh, seven areas are Inland California, Inner Bay Area, Los Angeles, Northern California, Northern Central Valley, Outer Bay Area, and Southern Central Valley. So all together, we represent every county in the state of California with this survey. And we're looking for it now to uh, prepare and present the valuable sharings and the results feedback of our statewide survey. Thank you. Wow, that's a, that's a lot, Dee Dee. A whole statewide survey on homelessness in the state of California, which covers a wide area, right? So thank you so much for sharing. And I think it was really important to say that the members were representative of the community. I think that's a very key point in, in the board, uh, in the makeup of the board. So thank you for um, speaking a little bit to that. Sharon, would you mind sharing a little bit about your role on the Fairfax Commission on Aging? And how did you become a member and what is the work of a commission on aging? I become a, became a member by being appointed by my district supervisor. So the commission on aging is a board made up of 12 volunteers, each appointed by their magisterial supervisor. I've been a member for eight years. We are the Community Advisory Committee for the Fairfax Area Agency on Aging as required by the Older Americans Act. So we are an advisory committee. Our job is to advocate for services and programs for older adults. We testify before the Board of Supervisors, which is our governing board, um, on policy and budgetary issues. And our big challenge right now is that the Board of Supervisors has a shape the future of aging plan for 2023 to 2028, which is to guide Fairfax County and the community in meeting the needs of older residents now and in future years. So our job is to look at all of the issues come up with possible plans that could address them and figure out ways that the community, not the government, but the community along with Fairfax County can address these needs. So community involvement is very important here. Thank, thank you, Sharon. And I think it says a lot about um, the makeup of a commission uh, on aging in the sense that they are representing different districts within that um, community and that the work that you're doing is really to advocate on behalf of older adults and really focus because um, I think there's a requirement, right, uh, Sharon, that you have to be a certain age to sit on the Commission on Aging. I'm not positive that uh -huh. what that age is. I know that I am probably at 81 
one of the oldest, if not the oldest member. Mm -hmm. And that this was identified in the Older Americans Act. So there is a, a very strong uh, purpose for having a, a commission on aging uh, in the various uh, communities throughout uh, the country. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, you must be at least 60 years old. To I, I was going to say aging. 65, but I'm not mm -hmm. positive. Well, either, either way, 60, 65, right. the real point is that it is made up of people with whom the services, et cetera, are targeted to. So right. who best to share input than the per than the population of people who will be on the receiving end of those programs and services? Uh, agreed. And I think perhaps some of my, in addition to my work with the Department of Housing, I was instrumental in getting a hospice program started in Northern Virginia, and I was a caregiver for my husband for about nine years. So I have also real life, real life experience. Wow, thank um, what well, certainly uh, appreciate um, your sharing that and the experience that you had and how it impacts the development of programs and services. So, Linda, how do we get how do we authentically engage <laughs> in this type of work? Would you mind sharing a little bit about uh, Fairfax County's Volunteer Solution Program and your role in that regard? Sure, sure. sure. Our um, Volunteer Solutions was created in 1976 for the purpose of engaging volunteers in service and creating meaningful opportunities to use their expertise, their time, and their skills. Uh, in in the to improve the lives specifically of the populations of older adults, adults with disabilities, and family caregivers in this um, Fairfax, Virginia region. Um, and just in the last year, we've had close to 2,000 volunteers in our program, and they've contributed over 18,000 hours. Can you believe that? And it, their, their time is valued over um, half a million dollars. But they are, in addition to these stats, they are literally impacting the lives of these populations. You know, they are helping to maintain older adults in their homes so that they can age with dignity um, as so many older adults desire to do. Uh, so that is just a valuable piece of our program. And they're doing it in a lot of different ways, whether it's um, minor home repairs or grocery shopping, and um, they're doing it in just a lot of ways, um, which I'll talk about later. But, you know, volunteering not only fulfills a sense of purpose for our older adults, volunteers, but there are also a lot of benefits to volunteering, like improving um, mental and physical health. And so, um, you know, it's, it's healthy on both sides. And I did want to say that I wanted to address that there is this ageist view that an older adults are all tired, they're all ill, they're done with making big contributions. And so it's this whole, it's all downhill from here attitude that we simply just cannot generalize. And our volunteers are showing up in meaningful ways and making meaningful impacts. And we get to see that with volunteer solutions. So that's just something I love about our program. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Linda. It sounds like some great work being done there. And I think some of the points that you shared um, really point to needs that are out there in the community. And it also can highlight how older adults can uh, be at risk of homelessness. When you talk about help with some housing repair. We know that sometimes when uh, a home is under so much disrepair um, or an individual could be fined, zoning could fine or HOAs could fine uh, an older adult who is typically living on a fixed income. And that can lead down a precarious road uh, for that older adult. And, and we all know about food insecurity among older adults. And so having programs 
that help to um, do some grocery shopping and, and bring it to someone's home is, is really helpful. We know that there are those programs within the store, meal delivery or grocery delivery programs. Um, and in some cases, individuals could be a little leery about that. Um, they make relationships with the volunteers who are there, maybe on a you know biweekly basis uh, to grocery shop for them and with them, and then uh, uh, feel some sense of comfort in knowing who is there uh, picking their groceries for them. Or uh, and in some cases, those volunteers who are part of the home delivered meals program or meals on wheels program however it's uh, titled in your community. So thank you very much for uh, talking about how the Volunteer Solutions Program works, how it engages older adults and also supports older adults who are living in the community. When we talk about the value of authentic engagement, that it shows that like a mix of professional experience and personal lived expertise is, is really found to be essential for creating impactful solutions. And I think we heard that when we, you know, uh, when Sharon and Dee Dee both share their experience and then the work that they're doing on uh, these res respective uh, boards and commissions. Uh, Sharon, can you share with us how your experience as a former director of senior housing and services uh, for Fairfax County has helped in your role on the COA. You spoke a, a little bit about how you developed the first hospice program and then how you actually um, was involved in hospice care for your husband. How has, how has your professional, your former professional role helped in the work that's being done on the Commission on Aging? Well, I think sometimes people get the idea that, oh, it's easy to develop affordable housing. Well, by having a background in what it is like to develop affordable housing and you have to buy a piece of property and then you have to have architectural plans. And then you, it's, I think that my, understanding of the whole housing issue and development process have helped me to be a resource to the other commissioners who have other expertise. And so when we're making a decision about something or making a recommendation or advocating for something, I have some expertise that can be shared to broaden our, our commissioner, our commission as a whole. Um, because we all, one of the advantages of this board of 12 is that we all come from a different background. And I happen to be one who believes in the synergy of a group. And so when you've got somebody who's an expert in services and somebody who's an expert in, in the funding that comes from the Older Americans Act. So I understand funding that comes from HUD. Somebody else on the commission understands funding that comes from Older Americans Act. Somebody else, and so together we can share our expertise so that as a board, when we recommend something, we are recommending it with, with expertise gained from our years of work experience. Thank you so much, Sharon. Now, uh, Dee Dee, as, as an individual with lived experience of homelessness, how have you been able to uh, share insights of that experience to help influence the work of the board and uh, maybe some program development? Well, while we get Dee Dee back online, um, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to you, Linda. In, in your work in recruiting and maintaining volunteers, as we heard from Sharon, the level of experience and expertise that older adults bring to the work. Um, can you share with us 
what it's like and and your work in recruiting and maintaining volunteers and and perhaps even share some uh, best practices around uh, how programs can work to reduce barriers to engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, we're unique in that we're housed within the Agency on Aging. So really our program has to be designed for that population and has to really consider the older adult volunteers. So some of the ways we're reducing engagement is we allow people to serve in a variety of ways. So some people are serving in person, like teaching classes at a senior center, for example. But if the volunteer it cannot leave their home or is not mobile, we have opportunities for them to serve, um, like they make phone calls to some of our older adult clients to make sure they're taking their medication and checking in with them and building relationships. So you can see if that in these ways, even if they're not in person, they're still very meaningful like that. Those are very important volunteer roles, right? So um, another way is that we recruit multilingual volunteers so that they can serve multilingual clients so that those populations are not left out. Um, and we've expanded to have intergenerational opportunities that gives younger people an opportunity, like it's a real opportunity to build a relationship with an older adult. And so we actually have this group of um, high school sons and their moms that create handmade cards for our older adults around the holidays. And that's just a very special opportunity. Um, so there's a lot of ways people contribute, but um, also we focus on regionalization as a way to reduce barriers. So when someone signs up to volunteer with us, they're assigned a, have a connection to a regional um, volunteer manager in our very large county so that um, volunteers get these weekly emails on um, opportunities that are within their area where they live. And this allows volunteers to sign up for opportunities based on their availability, but also allows them to see a real impact in their own community by helping in their own community. Um, and another way we reduce barriers is by providing connections. So we have these monthly calls with our volunteers and that allows them to come together to network, and to um, you know, just have that ongoing dialogue with us as a system, and that helps impact the, the way we do our work. So those are just some of the ways we we reduce um, barriers to engagement. Wow, thank thank you so much mm -hmm. for that, and and thank you for um, really speaking to equity issues when you speak about language, uh, for example, um, that could be a barrier to engagement. I wonder, um, in, in this case, some things that come up uh, when we talk about having inclusive tables uh, is being seen and heard. And uh, sometimes there's the power dynamics that occur and um, what it means to be valued or seen as a contributing member. I wonder if in your respective roles, uh, could you share what that means to you? Maybe Linda, we'll start with you. For example, um, in, in, in engaging uh, volunteers, and in this case, older adults, what, what does that mean of having an inclusive table? Like, how do you ensure that? What steps uh, does the program take to really uh, foster that? Um, sense of uh, inclusivity and, and really helping uh, the participants, the volunteers, older adults to really not just feel, but to actually be heard and be seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and some of that's happening in these relationships that we really are building with them. You know, I was just um, at a meeting with one of our regional volunteers. She has a following, like they have a real relationship when they see her. We just saw them for the first time because of the pandemic, um, you know, guidelines. We just saw them in person for the first time. She knows so much about them personally. And so there's something to be said about just 
taking time to build those relationships where we know each other. Um, you know, in terms of the what this means to me is just that I I will say that you know for for me and in for our agency, older adults are valued members of our community, and the health of our community really depends on our ability to engage all ages, all ethnicities, all abilities, and you know, really the diversity of our population. And our county has a one Fairfax policy. And one of the values that that brings is that that we highlight is that when our vulnerable are lifted up, we all succeed. And so we're working from that value. And at the Agency on Aging, we see the critical role our older adults can play in their community with their skills, their time, and their perspective into creating just positive, lasting change. And so we have to learn to, you know, and continue to work across generations. And, um, and to me, that means addressing that ageism. And, you know, we have this older adult, Sharon mentioned it, we have this older adult community action plan in our county. And one of the taglines I learned when I started working with it is that what's good for older adults is good for all of us. Right. And, um, and, and, I, and so that I heard that first in that space, and that really requires a different approach. And so when we want to build a ramp in a community, you know, we, we, we want people think about wheelchairs, but we also have to think about strollers. And that is a way to think intergenerationally and work intergenerationally to really improve the community for everyone. And, you know, and that also, you know, there's a question in the chat, but I think this is one way where we can build support and advocates for making these types of needed changes. So when we're thinking about the young and the old and how we all benefit from a ramp, we're creating advocates for older adults and we're saying, oh yeah, you know, and them, and them. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get, you know, these older adult volunteers into the community and onto, um, onto advisory boards in the county because we want those advocates and we want them speaking in this way to build um, just this more collective, collective advocates for all our generations. We just had a presentation last month, actually, at the Commission on Aging mm -hmm. from one of our new commissioners on Generations United. And Irv gave a great example of how in the past, perhaps, parks have been designated with a playground for kids. And then over here, some seating where older adults could sit and watch. But if you have some tables in between, or where the older adults and the younger people can play games or can actually interact with each other, it benefits everybody. So it's, it, it is, as Linda said, it is kind of a new way of thinking that, that there are benefits to younger people when we take care of older people and there are wonderful benefits to older people when we take care of, you know, we want our children to be safe and and well housed as as well as we want old people to have affordable housing so you know affordable housing crosses all age range thank you both for really speaking to and i hope mandy that that answers or uh, speaks to your comment about the us versus them dynamic uh and and the whole idea of youth and families versus older adults. I think uh, as, as the panelists uh, so well uh, articulated that we need to always think together, you know, how things from that may be targeted towards one segment of the population really benefits the entire, the whole population. And I wonder, um, in thinking about that, if there are some things that you feel are like really some of the most important things that could be put in place that helps to foster authentic engagement, uh, really um, that, that you see as important. 
Well, Linda probably knows as much about this as I do, but one of our favorite programs in Fairfax County, and now I'm going to have a senior moment about the older adults in the classroom. Um, yeah, what's Grand and Vol. Grand and Vol. Um, and so that is a totally volunteer program where older adults go actually into the schools and spend time with the children in in person. I mean, COVID impacted that a lot, but um, it's up and in person again, where, you know, a grandma or a grandpa goes into the school and actually reads to children for an hour a week or meets one on one with children one, once a week. And that gives little people an opportunity to be with the grandma when they lives in California. And it also gives older people a sense of purpose. It gives them a relationship. It gets them involved. It, it addresses social isolation. And when it first got started, we had, um, there were volunteers who were willing to come from a retirement community, but they had no way to get there. A local church had one of their church buses that would go to the retirement community, pick up the, the volunteers and take them to the school. So it was, you know, a win-win for everybody. And it was using a church bus that basically sat in the parking lot six and a half days a week. Um, and, and, and Dorothy has just morphed that program into a wonderful program that's gotten national recognition. So Grand Involve, you can you can google it and you will find it thank you for sharing sharing that um share and i think you know what um <clears throat> what we have heard is what it means to be looked at as an expert and to be valued for what you can share thank you Dee. Dee. welcome back what it means to be uh, included and to be able to share your experiences for the benefit of the community as a whole. And I, um, I, I see we have a few questions and I'm watching the time in the chat. Uh, one question spoke to how can HUD, the federal rules states, the local CLC make the process simpler and more effective to reach um, older adults. Dee Dee, do you mind uh, responding to that? How do you think that this overarching uh, system uh, with HUD at the lead, how can how can they help to encourage or support communities in reaching older adults? Oh my God. I'm sorry, I don't know. Everything just just returning. Um, okay. Were totally, you able to hear the question, Dee Dee? Um, yes, please. Yeah. Um, so the question was really about what what can be done to uh through um the overarching uh system, homeless services system with HUD to help communities to best reach older adults. If HUD, uh, I believe if HUD actually established uh, a complete database of homeless individuals, not homeless, but seniors, and from there uh, having uh, an ability to basically track uh, needed information on each individual, if HUD was able to do that, um, then I believe the services could be directly um, uh, in connection with those who need uh, just a complete database uh, of seniors. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. And I can, I, I, I don't remember who put the uh, question in there, but there's also work being done uh, through with HUD and the Administration for Community Living 
um, in a in a uh, collaboration called um, the Housing and Services Resource Center that brings together HUD and our CEO from the National Alliance in Homelessness sits there and uh, the Aging Network folks. So different um, leaders in those respective um, sectors are really looking at ways and talking about ways to help to foster further collaboration um, uh, within those different sectors to support older adults. Um, so some of that is upstream, so preventative type measures, as well as how to respond to older adults who are experiencing homelessness, uh, who are coming into the system and have unique needs, and how can we support them to address those needs and get them uh, rapidly um, housed. Mm -hmm. I know speaking as a senior, personally, I am very active, um, but I'm alone. When I leave the meeting or the activity, I come home, I'm alone. So I know as a senior, my number one concern is if anything uh, happened to me, uh, there's no one to really that I'm in touch with. So that's what I, uh, you know, I, I feel that it's very important to at least be on record <laughs> that uh, the seniors we exist and a lot of us are alone and we don't have that connection to uh, at least provide that this is this is what's going on with this individual you know uh, and uh, that's why I personally feel that if, if my name was on record somewhere and uh, there was someone to uh, be in contact with me on a daily basis then that would alleviate a lot of concern for, you know, for me and for I'm sure a number of homeless people, not homeless, but seniors in my same position. Sorry, that's a very good point, uh, Dee Dee. And in some uh, communities they have, although this is not exactly what you're speaking to, but there's something called like a special registry where people uh, no. who are living, uh, alone have some type of disability um, are identified so that if there are some emergencies, people know social services knows to reach out to them. And also um, there are programs and Linda might say a little bit about this um, through the aging network. And, and of course, every, every area agency on aging in different communities provide um, some services that uh, may not look the same in other communities. So for example, Linda, maybe you might talk a little bit about like telephone reassurance, our friendly visitor program, some of those kinds of ways that of connecting with um, an individual who is uh, living in the community and, um, and do not have, maybe do not have relatives or friends, et cetera, in, in close proximity. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I um, actually, somebody in the chat just wrote about one of them. So that's something to take a look at, Dee Dee. And um, there are friendly visitor programs within, even actually our volunteers do that, provide that for some of our most isolated clients. We do um, provide that as well as we have actually some community organizations. So I think it's always, if you're interested in those types of programs, it's good to reach out to an agency on aging because they're aware of those types of resources in the community. And I mean, thankfully, a, the agencies on aging are found throughout the US um, because it's part of the Older Americans Act. But yes, those, those we have um, some form of that within county government, but also um, through nonprofits in the community. Thank you so much. And I guess the, I'm, I'm watching the time, we have one minute left and I saw someone ask the question, and um, really specific to Fairfax County and talking about adult uh, foster care program. Um, <clears throat> and maybe that might be a question um, that we can respond to um, uh, specifically to, to you. Would you um, please share in the Q&A like your contact information and then we'll get Linda to be able to respond to you that way. 
And listen, it has been um, my pleasure to um, have this conversation with our panelists to facilitate that type of conversation. And I hope that you walk away with this sense of um, understanding, maybe further understanding of the importance of authentic engagement among older adults, older adults who are experiencing homelessness, anyone with some lived experience and older adults, especially, um, especially as we see the number of older adults who are experiencing homelessness continue to increase in our respective communities. And I wanna give a plug out to the Alliance and to Rachel, because many of, um, we hold a lot of uh, work like this, um, webinars on these specific topics that may be of interest to folks that we hope they find, we hope you find valuable. But also we have other um, ways to learn. We have an online learning system and maybe Rachel, you might wanna share a little bit about what the Alliance uh, online, online learning system looks like. Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, we wanna offer training in forms that are flexible and, and that meet the needs of uh, different types of different types of organizations. So in addition to live webinars and uh, contract-based live training in communities, we also offer self-paced training through our Center for Learning. Um, these are courses which uh, individuals or organizations can enroll in on a on an individual basis. Um, and uh, and you know, upskill in, in the core sort of core things that the alliance focuses on, housing first, rapid rehousing, trauma-informed care. I'll put the uh, the URL in the chat, and if you have it, and I'll put my email as well. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you for the shout out, Yolanda. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope that this was um, informative and that you walk away with a greater sense of purpose as it relates to engaging uh, folks with lived experience. And many, many thanks to the panelists. Thank you so very much for taking time to have this conversation with us. All right, everyone, look forward to receiving the slides uh, early next week and for information to be posted on our uh, webpage. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.